Thank you so much for the opportunity that we have of being here, the opportunity to love you and honor and adore you this morning. Father, we thank you for mothers. We thank you for what they mean in our lives, and Father, continue to mean to us. Father, we just pray that you'll continue to bless them, watch over them. Father, this morning, bless all of us as we're here to honor and adore you. We pray that you'll inhabit the service with us. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. I think those kids need to get out of here. <laughs> Please stand.
that are eating it here today. You see, this meal not only symbolizes the wedding banquet of Christ and his bride, it shows us all who will be there. It's us. These are the people with whom we'll spend eternity in a better place with, praise God, better bodies, eating better food, but not with better people. It'll be the same people, except more. And so as we eat and drink, discern the body, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the people in this room with whom we'll live forever. If you've ever wondered why Jesus says it's so important to love each other, now you know. It's because we're going to be living and eating together with Jesus for a very long time. And the best meals are with the people we love. Let's bow our heads and our hearts in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Grace Spot. We prepare to come to your table this morning. Remember to have son. Do this remember that you came down here in flesh through a mother. And who is so blessed. <clears throat> we give thanks that she pondered, took care of you, <clears throat> your son while he was on his earth. He gave him loving to drink. As we thank all mothers who you created and did the same. We prepare to come to your table. We humbly come in remembrance of your son sacrifice his life. Willing. So we may be with you one day in your paradise. At your table. With you forever. We thank you, O oh gracious Father. We pray this in your precious Son, Jesus Christ's name.
か
Christians to come on that night. Just teasing. Easy. Easy. <laughs> um, that it gets really hard on a holiday to preach a sermon. I mean, you can only use Esther and Ruth so many times and, and Mary and, and just... You know, over the years, we've tried to come up with something for uh, Mother's Day. So today, we're just going to talk about um, abiding in God. Did you see that with mothers? We'll tie it all together. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Starting here at verse 1, Jesus speaking, if you have a red letter edition, you'll see that it's red, so Jesus speaking, he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you, are, unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in, in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, my word remains in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So, what is he saying? He's saying, abide in me. If you abide in me and I in you, then you will bear fruit. King James Version, abide. What does the word abide mean? Same as. In the Greek it means to dwell within. So if you dwell within my word, I will dwell within you. Now, to dwell, to go deeper into it, it says it's a permanent place. How many of you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? How many of you dwell in Him? It's a permanent place. How many of you dwell in His Word? Not as many hands. What happened? When we tell you that it's a permanent place, all of a sudden you start thinking, hmm, do I go there all the time? To give you an example, how many of you have ever stayed in a hotel? I'm just going to tell you something. You don't dwell there. It's not a permanent place. It's somewhere where you visit. You might get a night or two stay and then you move on. Where are you going? To the place that you dwell. Where is that place? I was putting this together and I got thinking, I have dwelled in 11 different places. 7645 New Hampshire. That was my first dwelling. I dwelt there from birth until about age 4. 726 North Wheeler. I dwelled there from age 4 till I graduated high school. 607 North Carol Malone Boulevard. I dwelled, I dwelled there from age 18 to age 21. It was a college. And I, I dwelled there. I even stayed summers. I traveled for the school, so I was a year-round resident of that dwelling. <coughs> then I went to Portsmouth, Ohio. I lived in a house next to the church that I'd like to give you the address. It had none. The postman said, I just know it's you. 
because the address was really at the corner of Grandview and Robinson, where the church was, but they knew the church house was where I lived. <clears throat> to live in a place that had no address. Ever lived in a place that had no address? <clears throat> then I went to uh, 617 Nancy Street, Lexington, Kentucky. Lived there for a little while, dwelled for a while. I mean, I could go through the whole list. There are several places here that I've lived, but I have dwelled in places that I thought would be permanent. Now, I know this I'm going to dwell in a place that has no address for an eternity. I'm going to dwell in a place that just has a name. Simply like Central Church of Christ, Portsmouth, Ohio, I'm going to live in heaven. Where is that? Where God abides. Abides? Lives? Stays permanently forever? And what are you going to do there? Live? Stay? Forever. So I'm going to abide. So he says, but if you abide in me, I'll abide in you. But if you're not in me, I am not in you. Now abide means to stay permanently. How many of you can say that you abide permanently every day in and out with God? How many of you sin? What happens when you sin? Separate from God. Okay? Does not mean you're not still there. You're just not exactly where He is. Because He can't have anything to do with where you have gone. Right? Anyone here ever go to the grocery store? <laughs> Quick trip, right? My wife, have, my wife has found this um, order online. <laughs> she can actually pull up in her pajamas. They fill the Batmobile with groceries, and off she goes. If you know the commercial, you know, or the party wagon, or whatever it is that comes up there. They fill it up and you go home. It's a quick trip. Sin shouldn't happen, but when it happens, if you're a Christian, it should be a what? Quick trip. You shouldn't stay there. You should not want to dwell there. It's something that you have to get rid of. And God has given us the ability to give for forgiveness. Anyone here ever require forgiveness? Sometimes more than you wish you had required forgiveness? I mean, and here we are in a story, and he's talking about these vines. And who did he say the gardener was? God. And God is going to do what to the vine? Jesus. Take care of it. Prune it so that it grows. And he's going to do what to the branches? us that are on that body. One of two things. He's going to prune us because we're bearing fruit and he's going to prune us so that we bear more fruit or he's going to cut us off because we're useless to the body. That's a pretty harsh story. When you look at it, when you look at that story and it, that's tough. You're either producing fruit or you're gone. <clears throat> and when you look at that and look at your life, you have to ask yourself a question, which am I? Which am I? Am I a fruit producer or am I worthless? Gary said in Sunday school, there's no middle of the road. There's no, we know what happens there at the middle of the road, lukewarm stuff. You're one or the other. What are you? Yes. God. Yes. And, and they keep going through it and explaining, now if you're in me, <coughs> then you'll produce fruit. If you're not, you're gone. If you remain in me, I will remain in you. 
If you remain in Jesus, he'll remain you. And it says in there then, to abide in the word. Abide, dwell. What is it? What do we say it meant? To abide, to dwell, to live. Live how? Permanently. Permanently in the word. How many of you live permanently in the word? Let me read for you uh, Psalms 91.1, King James Version. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So if you're in the secret place of Jesus, you'll abide under the shadow of God. If you are not, where do you think you abide? Apart. Take, the, take the opposite of it. Apart. apart from it. If you're apart from it, then what are you? Proverbs 1, 24-26 Amplified Version says, It's a warning to those who don't listen and obey the Word of God in good times. It says, if you don't listen and obey the God, Word of God in good times, what makes you think He's going to be there in the bad times? To abide means to dwell, which means to live permanently there. Meaning, we should be in the Word when? Always. Always. Abiding in the Word. How do we abide in the Word? How are we always there? Living. What if I was to say today, okay, everybody here, hand in your phones, your tablets, and your Bibles. Stack them up here in the front row. And I handed you a sheet of paper and a pencil, and I said, okay, let's rewrite the Bible. <laughs> not make it new, not, let's just write what we remember of the Bible. How much would we rebuild of the Word? Not enough. Not near enough. Cindy would have Jesus wept, for sure. That's her favorite verse. So we know we'd have that. I'm sure we'd have John 3.16. I mean, we're very lucky. We're very lucky because we have Winnie, who likes to memorize Scripture, who would throw some out there for us. In alphabetical order. In alphabetical order. We have Ken, who has memorized chapters of books, who could throw some out there for us. How many of us could join them? How many of us would be able to rewrite Scripture? Now, I tell you this because I, I went this week looking at it, and there are so many stories out there of people who were captive in the war, or people who were lost at sea, or, or all these different stories of people that had no hope. What kept them alive? Word of God. Because at some point in their life, they dwelled in it. I mean, I read one story where a guy knew 11 scriptures. He wrote down his 11 scriptures. When they were in the yard, when they were let out of their, this seems weird, their three by three box that they were kept in. When they were let out of that box into the yard for the one hour a day, they would find things in the yard that they could scratch on, scribble on something, and write down these verses. They were writing on the walls of their little cubes they were stored in, is what the guy referred to it as. We were stored in these boxes until they decided to come get us and have more fun with us. Torture. Yeah. And for that hour each day in the yard, they would find ways to 
go by each other and pass what they remember. 17 POWs. All writing down scriptures they could remember. How many scriptures did the 17 POWs have? Thirty-two. You think of well, the one guy had eleven, so if they each had eleven, we well, they found out that five guys never went to church. Five guys had this much to donate to their scriptures. One guy thought it was scripture. We always thought, used to think it was scripture. He scratched on a leaf. Understand, it scratched on a leaf with a rock. Godliness is next to cleanliness. It's all he knew. <clears throat> to dwell in the Word means to dwell in the Word that you could live without. Understand it. Live without it. Um, Carol Bird sent me an a email this week. Uh, disturbing. Disturbing email. And they're getting ready to vote on House Bill, and I forget the number. You remember the number? That is the equalizing of people. The equality of people bill. But what that bill does is strips people like us of our religious rights. Because it's not equalizing. What we do is we separate and we condemn people according to the bill. And so it's, it's a really bill set out to hurt the Christians. Now, how many of you have heard of the bill? I don't care with it because she said it to me. I mean, they're going to vote on this. The main thing it's going to do is allow them to tell you what you can and can't do. What you can and cannot say. It's a high bill on, on LGBTQ. LGBTQ. You know that anything in the Bible that has to do with that would not be allowed to be spoken of. Would not be allowed to be taught against. Would not be allowed to be, I mean, because it, it, it separates. We couldn't any longer speak about abortion. It separates. Everybody needs to be equal. It's a far-reaching bill of those things, and, and it might pass. Because we don't dwell in God. Because we don't dwell in His Word. Because we don't because we don't dwell there. We don't act there. How many of you have ever written a senator? Congressman? Governor? I mean, tell them what you think. This is not a, not a political sermon, but it, this is something that's coming up that we have to look at because these prisoners thought that they fought for us here to have the freedom to gather, the freedom to worship as we saw fit. And they feel that that freedom is about to be they stayed in their three by three cubes, one of them for nine years before being liberated. Writing their verses, doing their things so that we could dwell in God. 
so that we could dwell in His Word, so that we could be His in the ways that we see fit. They might come take your Bible. They might try to eradicate it from the internet. Because it is divisive, not equalizing. I mean, we, we live in a world that, that this morning on the news, they said the most hated group in the world is Christians. On the news, they said it. We are being tormented and, and picked upon more now than almost any time in history. And here we sit with the gardener and the vine and we're to be the branches. Are you producing fruit? Are you making a difference? See, we're meant to be permanent, not, not sedentary. We're meant to be complete, completely His. When you walked an aisle and came down and accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it was a complete, here, I surrender. We sing it, I surrender what? All. All. Paul says that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Christ now dwells in me. Permanent. We gave up control. Or did we? Abiding in God is meant to be then a lifestyle. Something we live. Every day, every minute, every hour. I mean, I sat down this week and I started writing some scriptures. <coughs> I wrote enough scriptures that I, I thought was good. I thought, okay, well, I, I at least know these. Trust me, it wasn't good. The amount that you could recall that some of them weren't right. But I wrote it down and I looked it up and I thought, oh. These, these words. It's not what I think it is, it's what he says it is. How many of us change words because we're fitting into things? They want us to change to what they believe, not what he says to word. It's a lifestyle that we have to dwell in, we have to abide in. So we have to be permanently in too. It's a lifestyle that will change you forever. Who you are and what you do. It will change what you stand for. Who you stand for. When you read this scripture about being in, in, in Him, it says, This is to be to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It's not for our glory. We're not doing this for us. We're doing it for Him. And what are we doing for Him? What are you doing in your life for Him? What do we do? I mean, we come together here to worship Him, but it seems like we get more out of this than we give. If you look at your daily life, inward workings, outward workings, things you're going through, how much of your day is for Him? How much of what you're doing is going to make a difference in His kingdom? Or is it for us? 
Because I read this and I kept reading it, kept going over and over and over. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I keep reading that. Apart from him. And yet, we sin. We separate ourselves from God. We're apart from him. What can we do? What do we have to do when we're apart from Him? Return. Return. Get grafted back on. <coughs> Get put back onto that vine that we're holding tight to. We're supposed to be learning not to sin no more. We're supposed to be learning how to live in Him. To abide in Him. To be a permanent place in Him. question is, how are you doing in that quest? The better question is, are you even working on it? Because if we're not acknowledging him in the good times, that quiet version, why would he even acknowledge us in the bad? If we're not staying connected to him, I mean, if we're not giving him the glory and the honor because of what we're into and what we're part of, why would he do that? I told you I'd tie this into the mothers. I mean, looking to it and trying to think of it, I mean, how many of you uh, dwell with your mother? How many of you does your mother dwell with you? We're not saying physically. My mom was here for three months. She was in North Carolina for a month. She's back in Chicago now. I mean, she's not here, but she's here. Does she dwell here? Yes. If your mother has passed, do you still think of her here? Yes. You know, when Mother's Day comes around, we still, gosh. For, all, for those of us lucky still have our moms, we're still there. We abide in it. The uh, uh, Andy Stanley used these three words. We have a connection to them. How many of you have, how many of you have a connection to your mom? Or you wouldn't be here without it. <laughs> he says, we have a dependence. How many of you have a dependence on mom or the memory of mom? I mean, we had to defend to the point that we, we now are part of mom. Mom taught us things in life that we now do ourselves. I mean, there were things that my mom did that I said, when I grow up, I will never do that. <laughs> I will never say those things to my kids. But I have said, I brought you into this world, I can pick you up. <laughs> They've heard it. And every time I said it, it's like, oh, I said I wouldn't say that. But I have a dependence on her because of what she has taught and put into me. It's there. It's going to be there. And at certain times, it's going to come out. And then he says, we have a continuance. Whether they are alive or dead, we have a continuance in our mothers. We know who they were. We, knew, we know what they stood for. We know what their desire is in us. I mean, it's, it's not Father's Day, but my dad has been gone 20 some plus years. And still today we're, we're doing things saying, man, I hope my dad's proud of me. He's gone. And yet we still think that because we have this continuance in them that they have instilled into us this. And so we try to do this because it might make them proud. It might make them happy or delight in us. So those are the same three things we just talked about. We do them with our mothers. We do them with our fathers. We, we, we have this connection to, this dependence upon, and this continuance in. Read those verses again. We have a connection to. God through Jesus Christ the Father. 
We have a dependence on Jesus to give us the nutrients and what we need in this life. I mean, we have this dependence in His Word to teach us and show us what we ought to be. And we have a continuance in that. We have to continue that until we get there. Where? I mean, you know, you know you're going to one of two places. Based on this life, based on our connection to or lack of connection to, we are going to spend an eternity somewhere. Today we choose. Every day we choose that eternity. Have you chosen more of God or more of Satan? <clears throat> Have you allowed God to lead and guide or is Satan? Because one of the two is. In Sunday school, we're talking in the book of James, we're talking about the tongue, and it tells us in the scripture that no man can tame that tongue. Can't be done. It's a wild beast. It sets the world on fire and it tells you that the fire there comes from your lesson. It says in the word hell. Hell itself it, it fires it up. I mean, hell itself is fighting for your soul. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose whom you will serve. Choose who you are going to be connected to, dependent upon, and have continuance in. As for me and my house, we've chosen. We've chosen. Who do you choose in your life? Are you a fruit bearing part, branch of a vine? Or are you worthless? ready to be cut off and thrown into the fire. <coughs> and the choice is yours. We're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation. It's for your chance to choose. To choose to be grafted and held, holding on tight to that vine. To allow Christ to shine in you. To bear fruit for the glory of God. Or to let go. Every day we choose that. Today is God's day, or is today my own, be off the vine and doing my own thing? We've got to be careful when we're off the vine. That Christ doesn't return to that one. So we're going to stand and sing, and if you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have a desire to do that, if you want to be grafted onto the vine of Christ, to be gardened by God, Dancing, choose. Or maybe you're here this morning and you've already chosen. Maybe this morning you need to be pruned a little. <laughs> Ask God to prune you that you can bear fruit for Him. Whichever it is, it has the <laughs>
to the vine of mom and dad. And mom and dad give us the things we need. They put the food on the table. They give us education. They give us everything. Clothes on our backs, roof over our heads. They even give us discipline. And what they expect is for us to do as the vine instructs. Here's what we expect of you. Some of us growing up hung with uh, non-vine dwellers. I, I can give you names. They were non-vine dwellers. They didn't listen well at all to their parents. And they told us we didn't have to. And I remember a couple times when we said, okay, we can do that. And I remember after we did that thing, the vine coming up to us and saying, where have you been? What have you been doing? Why did you, and we thought we hit it well. We thought there's no way they'll ever know. And one of the two of them, my dad or my mom, would say, why did you do the following? And in my mind, I would never say it out loud, but in my mind I'm going, how do you know about that? And from that came discipline. And sometimes it was spanking. Sometimes it was a bar of soap in your mouth. Sometimes it was grounded for whatever period of time they determined was appropriate for what you did. And we need to know that as Christians, as we're connected to a vine, as God is our gardener, we have to expect the same. That as we live our lives, as we connected to, depending upon, continuing in, when we break that, when we sin and step outside of that, there's discipline. And it's going to be upon God and Jesus to determine that discipline. But we know the ultimate discipline in life are those words, depart from me for I never knew you. The words that I don't think anybody in this room wants to hear. But could. If we're not dwelling in. If we're not abiding in. If we're not permanently connected to the body and His Word. If we're not in Him. So this week I pray that you are in Him. And if you are not, that you will find a way to reconnect in Him. So that He can give you the nutrients and everything you need to be successful in this life for His glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had to be here. The opportunity for once again, Father, just to commune with you, to worship you, to honor you by our presence. Father, we ask now that you strengthen us, that you uh, help to graft us tighter in, that, Father, the things we do are about you. And this life, Father, is about you. Father, guide us to this week. Watch over us, protect us, be with all the mothers, Father. Bless them for the ways they have blessed us. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. A real quick, real quick. Um